Good morning to each of you. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's a beautiful day. It's been a beautiful fall season here on the plateau. Thank you for those who are visiting and passing through uh, to enjoy our area. We pray your safety as you travel on to your home. For those that are visiting from our area, certainly stick around. Let us have the opportunity to get to know you and hopefully try to help you and serve you in whatever way we can when our time of worship is completed. To those online and by conference call, as you've heard, we have a long list of those folks dealing with sickness and various other struggles. So those joining us by that means, we're happy that you're with us as well. It's the Thanksgiving season. I know I don't have to tell you that. Only 57 days remain in the year 2023. That's almost impossible to believe, isn't it? This is the first Sunday in November and just a few more weeks we'll celebrate that as a national holiday. So let me ask you this question as we begin. <clears throat> In fact, it will be the question that guides our study for the next two weeks as well. Why are you thankful for Jesus? Why are you thankful for Jesus? Now, in one sense of answering, that would be very simple, you might say. That's an easy question to answer for anyone that has any acquaintance whatsoever with who Jesus is. On the other hand, it's an impossible question to answer at least to answer it fully and comprehensively. But if I were to ask you that question, just as I just did, in your mind, if I could read your mind, which I certainly cannot, or if we were to ask people generically, maybe tomorrow at work, if you were to ju uh, just walk up to a coworker that you're aware they have some maybe religious affiliation, and ask them, why are you thankful for Jesus? I'm guessing, and I've not tried to do a study to prove this, but I'm guessing that most people would speak to what Jesus did for us in the past. And that's a good thing to think about. In fact, we're commanded to do that, and we will in just a few moments when this lesson concludes, as an act of our worship, we will take unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. We will take these as emblematic of the body and blood of Jesus given for us when he sacrificed himself on the cross. And so you would say, I'm thankful Jesus died for my sins. And that's something certainly to be thankful for. And we'll explore that in one of the lessons that remain this month, the Lord willing. Uh, on the other hand, some might say, you know, well, I'm thankful for Jesus concerning the future. He gives me hope and I can look forward not just to the end of this life and death, as scary as that is for some people, it's not for me. I know what's coming next. I know what Jesus is making ready. John 14, when he gets that mansion, as the older versions translate it, when he gets those dwelling places ready and prepared, he's going to come again and he's going to take me to be with him. And I'm so thankful for that. And I look forward to it with great anticipation. And yes, we'll explore that idea in a future lesson as well. But this morning, I want to take you to an often what I believe to be neglected topic. And to introduce that idea, I would ask you this question. What is Jesus doing right now? What is Jesus doing right now? I think if you will study with me together this morning, you will gain an appreciation for what He's doing right now, and that will enhance your gratitude for what He does on your behalf. Now again, if you were just to ask the question off the cuff to someone, what is Jesus doing right now? They might say, hmm, I guess He's on some sort of perpetual vacation, isn't He? Now, this might be your idea of the perfect vacation spot. It looks like a pretty good spot to spend some time relaxing. Notice there's no people around. There's just you and the palm trees and the hammock and the waves. That would be a, a good vacation spot for me. Maybe even better if I could find just a hammock between two, uh, two trees and a mountain stream uh, and the leaves gently falling. No one around to bother me. Well, I'll let Amy come along, but she wouldn't be bothering me. Uh, that would be my ideal vacation spot. But when you think of what Jesus is doing right now, is this something that maybe pops in your head? He's just, he's just on vacation. He's hanging out waiting for the Father's command to return. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. In fact, to the contrary, the Bible tells us that Jesus is very active on our behalf, even at the present. To help you 
understand this idea if you were paying attention, which I trust you were while we were singing. This idea was alluded to in each of the songs that Brother John led. But here are the verses that help us get in our minds what we're talking about. The first comes from Romans chapter 8. What a marvelous uh, chapter of Scripture. Uh, one that I turn to again and again. And each time I read Romans chapter 8, I'm impressed with some amazing thing that God has made available to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, of course, in context, the entirety of the wonderful letter that Paul wrote to the Christians at Rome needs to be studied and digested and deeply reflected on. But chapter 8 begins by telling us, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the child of God, uh, that's a promise that should thrill our souls. In this same chapter, he will tell us beautiful things like, even though we cannot possibly, in my opinion at least, possibly comprehend how God does it, we know according to verse 28 that the circumstances of life He can orchestrate and weave together so that not even the difficult, tough, terrible things that happen, they're not good. And don't presume that that's what Paul says. They're not. So much in life is anything but good. And yet Paul says God can make all things work together for good to those that love the Lord to those who are the called according to His purpose. How He does that in His providential workings, again, is beyond my feeble mind's capability to fully comprehend. But for our purposes this morning, notice, if you will, beginning in verse 33. There Paul asks a question, rhetorical in nature. In other words, based on what he said in this chapter, really in this entire letter, you should have no problem answering immediately, the question that he asked, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? In other words, God's elect are those people who have taken his gospel plan as he has laid out even before eternity, uh, before creation in eternity past, and with the help of the Son and with the Holy Spirit, put it into motion. And now it has occurred that Jesus has died, defeating death, being raised the third day from the grave and ascended back to the Father. Uh, those who now respond to that good news message and accept it by faith, as chapter uh, 5 especially makes clear, who can bring a charge against God's elect? Who's going to make you feel guilty or separate you from the standing that you enjoy in Christ Jesus? It is God, Paul answers it immediately, who justifies Justify, or as it is also used in this same chapter, the idea of justification throughout this epistle is a word that talks about the legal exoneration that we have. In other words, in the court of God, in His justice, through Jesus, even though I am a sinner, if I cover my life and my soul with His blood, He declares me innocent. And you've heard, I know the ladies, I think, are studying uh, this exact workbook uh, this particular quarter. Brother Winkler was often fond of saying, justified, you can break it down, and it makes me just as if I'd never sinned. A little play on words, but that's beautiful. And that's what the Christian can enjoy once he or she becomes a child of God. The Christian is made just as if I'd never sinned. By the blood of Christ. God justifies us through Christ. So who is he who condemns? He continues in verse 34. It is Christ who died. Now, usually, this goes back to what I said in the introduction. These are matters of the past. What Jesus did then. And even to those of us who have been obedient to our past. What we did when we made the God-appointed answer in obedience to the gospel. But notice how he continues. It is Christ who died, furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God. That's present tense. That's where he's at right now, at the side of the Father in heaven. Not as he... Uh, there simply to relax, to kick back and to take it easy, to put his feet up and just drink sweet tea. That's not what Jesus is doing. No, right now, at the right hand of God, he is there because he is there to also, notice, make intercession for us. To make intercession for us. 
Another passage of Scripture I invite your attention to be given to is from the Hebrew writer in chapter 7. The Hebrew writer trying to impress his readers not to return to the old way of doing things, not to Judaism, not to give up on the Savior. Jesus is better. And all throughout this letter, he proves that again and again, over and over by a number of comparisons. But talking about the priesthood, he is better. And in chapter 7, to bring that argument to a sort of climax, speaking of Jesus, he says, Jesus, he is also able to save to the uttermost. Those who come to God through him, that is, through Jesus, since. Why can he do that? He always lives to make intercession for them. Now, that's a beautiful idea, isn't it? Now, for this particular passage, let me just uh, give you a, a brief explanation. That idea of saving to the uttermost. The last verse of chapter 2, the Bible says Jesus is able to help us. In the last or the second to last verse in chapter 4, he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. But now in chapter 7, verse 25, he is able to save. That's what we truly need most of all. Even though his help and his sympathy are much appreciated, we need to be saved. And he is able, Jesus is capable of saving to the uttermost. Now, that's language that I would perhaps... Uh, not use on a regular basis. In fact, I, I can't remember ever in just regular conversation with someone uh, say to the uttermost. If you were uh, like my boys were uh, watching Toy Story and even before my boys were born, I watched a few Toy Story uh, movies as well. But you remember Buzz Lightyear said to infinity and beyond. It's a movie reference. Well, that idea is somewhat uh, what the Hebrew writer is talking about, but a little different. Uh, the word in the original language, pentelase, is used only one other time in the New Testament. In Luke 13, 11, uh, Jesus encounters a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. We don't really know what that was, but the Bible said that she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Sometimes as our bodies break down, whether it's an arthritic condition or something else, you can imagine, and some of us, and many of us have seen older people, uh, you know, that just with the ravages of time, they're almost bent double, as it were. And this poor woman for 18 years had been in a way where she could not raise herself up. That's the word that's used here in a negative sense. She could not completely be uh, standing just as you and I can do without much thought or effort. Now, Jesus, in this passage, in Hebrews chapter 7, He always lives to the uttermost to save us. That is, He has the idea, the word denotes comprehensiveness. He can save comprehensively, completely, exhaustively. Jesus can save us completely from all that we need saving from for all time. That's the idea. What a beautiful idea it is. Now, Jesus does not save halfway, partway, or part of the time. You know, all of us, I think, have some deep recesses within our soul. I know that I do. I have some places in my soul, in my past, poor choices. Words that I spoke that I wish I would have never spoken. Actions that... I wish I could rewind the clock of time and do differently than what I did. All of us have those things. We talked about last Sunday night, the idea of regret. What a heavy burden that regret is to bear. And we sometimes think, well, can Christ reach those spots in my life? In those deepest and vilest crevices of my soul, is He able to save me in spite of that? And the Hebrew writer says, yes, absolutely He can. He can save to the uttermost. Well, why or how can he do this? What we're focusing on, and both passages have the underlined uh, part of the verse for emphasis, because he is able to make intercession for us. And that's what he's actively doing right now. Okay? What is that? Intercession. A word, again, not used typically in day-to-day -day conversation. It carries with it the idea that there are two parties or people or groups. 
and there is an individual that comes between them to make a case on behalf of one to the other. An easy way to illustrate it, although maybe not a perfect comparison, but uh, at least close enough to help us get in our minds, many of our educators understand that I don't know how frequently, I guess it's at least maybe once a semester or once an academic year, a parent-teacher conference will be held. And I know you teachers, that's probably your least favorite day on the calendar because little Johnny or little Susie, they never do anything wrong, at least according to mom or dad. But mom or dad might come in to make intercession. Most of the time, maybe it's not well-founded, but nevertheless, they're going to try to say, uh, you need to do something on behalf of my child, or you're being unfair to my child, or you need to be more lenient or more compassionate or give them additional help. It may be, and I know perhaps some of you teachers, you might have to do the intercession work with the parent and say, you need to help your child more at home. You need to give them the resources that they need to succeed. Now, that, that's one idea of intercession. If you're a sports fan, you know that in professional sports, these guys that make gazillions of money after only a season or two of making a gazillion, they want to make two gazillion, right? I'm just not happy. I can't live on a gazillion dollars a year. That's not a real number, you realize. I'm just hyperbolizing here. But what happens? A sports agent, he comes between the franchise or the team owner or whoever writes the check and the athlete, the player, and the sports agent said, let's come together. He wants two gazillion. You're going to pay him a gazillion. Why don't you just call it a gazillion and a half and call it a day? And everybody's happy, especially the agent, since he gets a cut of, you know, uh, the proceeds as well. Uh, that's the idea that we're talking about when it comes to intercession. Now, I was going to say that our political representatives that work on our behalf might be considered those who make intercession. But the Bible says not to lie, so I'm going to leave that, uh, leave that alone. In all seriousness... By Christ's death, we are justified by faith when we accept His sacrifice in our place. When we die to sin, when we're united with Him and buried with Christ in baptism, the Bible says we're raised to walk in newness of life. And you say, well, having done that, did Christ not do all that was needed for our salvation at that moment once I've accepted it? And the answer is yes. But what happens to me thereafter? For even though my old man of sin is destroyed, done away with, he dies when I obey the gospel, that does not mean that sin dies completely and entirely in me. I still sin. I still stumble. I still fall. And so we stress, and with good reason, because the New Testament stresses it, the need that we be faithful in our life and in our walk with Christ Jesus. Now, the idea that we... Our faithful has to be tempered because some people hear that word and they say, well, uh, if he says faithful, that means perfect. But that's not how the Bible uses the word. And should it use the word in that way, we would all be doomed. Because even though I have been obedient to the gospel and I have had my sins removed and forgiven by Christ, I still am a sinner. Now, I'm not in that category, living as a sinner separate from God. But I still sin and fall short of the glory of God because I'm a weak, I'm a weak uh, follower, imitator of Christ Jesus. And so the New Testament continues to emphasize that we need something. And what we need is the intercession of Christ, that He works on our behalf. And He is there at the side of the Father interceding for us. Now, maybe let me give you a caution. You may be thinking, well... Uh, is God a reluctant father to forgive? Or is he a forgetful father to forgive? And the answer to both of those questions is no. Intercession is, if you will, the continual application of the sacrifice of Jesus to our sins. It is Jesus continually helping and aiding and assisting us as he is by the Father's side. And telling the Father, not that the Father is unaware, but again, I think this language is used in Scripture to impress us and should cause our gratitude and our love to overflow continually that Jesus is doing this on my behalf right now, that He has an interest right now still in my welfare. Maybe it's the idea that He is turning the attention of the Father 
away from my sins to his sacrifice on my behalf. One author said that intercession in the way that it is often in fact used as least as we do it on behalf of others is prayer. Prayer. In John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, as it should rightly be termed, is a beautiful example. And Jesus tells these men who are listening not to impress them, but he's praying I believe out loud, he's verbalizing his thoughts so that these men can hear it. And he's praying to the Father and they're listening. I don't know if everyone did. I, I suspect probably not. But for those of us who were blessed to have a father or a grandfather or another family member, if we were blessed that when we were children, we heard them, maybe when sitting down for a meal or before retiring to bed or just at other times throughout the day, when they went to the Heavenly Father in prayer and they called you by name or they mentioned some situation that you were confronting with and they asked God to bless you with wisdom and guidance, you know how that made you feel. Some of us can recall those prayers as vividly as the day they were prayed, even if that were more than half a century ago. We remember and we were just filled with an overflowing sense of thanksgiving. Well, if you can take that idea and then maybe superimpose it onto the work of Jesus, because in John 17, Jesus said, I don't pray for these alone, but on, for those who will believe on me through their word. And while that was a present uh, thing that he was accomplishing then in that prayer in John 17, according to these passages, Romans 8, 33 and 34 and Hebrews 7, 25, he continues to do that as well. I still sin, but Jesus thankfully still saves. And he helps in doing that by means of his intercession. But let me give you one other thing that Jesus is doing, and it's certainly related to the first. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible tells me something about what Jesus is doing. That passage reads like this. John says, my little children. Now, when you hear that term, my little children, you might think, is he actually speaking to little children? No, it's a term of endearment. John is an older man. We think probably by the time he's writing, the last surviving of the 12 apostles. And so he's writing with a tender term of endearment. And these people are adults and are of all ages. There were some little children who might have by chance heard this epistle read, but he's not talking about their chronological age. He's just speaking to them in a very tender way as their spiritual father, as it were, the mentor, the preacher, the teacher, uh, the one that had helped them develop their faith and now wants them to continue therein. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Now, if you pause there for a moment, you might say, but you said a moment ago that you still sin. I did, for good reason. And John is not trying to introduce the possibility that we can avoid sin altogether because in verse 8 of the previous chapter, at the same opening, probably in most of our Bibles, notice John says in 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You've met some self-deceived people, haven't you? I've met some people that I genuinely think that they thought they were without sin. How terrible to be so misled. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. The same chapter, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him, God, a liar. And His Word is not in us. And so in verse 1, when he says, I'm writing so that you may not sin, he's not trying to introduce the possibility as if that were even a possibility at all. We will sin, even after we walk in the light. But the blood of Jesus cleanses us when we confess our sins and say the same thing to God that we know to be true about our own lives. Verse 9 of chapter 1, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. Sin and uh, is not uh, something that, you know, God approves of in any measure. Uh, grace is not a license to sin. Uh, there is a mistaken notion floating around in the larger Christian world, using that in the broadest sense, that because God loves me so much and Jesus loves me so much and gracious and merciful they are, then I can live any way I choose. That's not the message of the New Testament whatsoever. To the contrary, grace incentivizes my obedience. 
God's love and mercy should prompt me and motivate me to walk just as closely as I can in the footsteps of the Savior. But what happens if anyone sins? And we all do, verse 1 continues, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Again, reflecting on what I've said to this point, maybe too often we give our attention to verse 2. Jesus Himself is the propitiation. A big word that can be defined as a substitutionary sacrifice. In other words, in one word, the gospel writers inspired by the Holy Spirit try to summarize what Jesus did. When He died on the cross for our sins, He died in our place. He paid the penalty for our sins. I should have died that day and eternally, but Jesus died in my stead. We sing about that, we preach about that, we remember that, and much, um, much more attention should be given to that each day in our own lives. For our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Not for a limited few, not a limited atonement. This atonement, this opportunity for salvation and justification, available to all who will receive it and respond as the Savior teaches. But verse 2, as beautiful as it is, does not negate what verse 1 tells us about what Jesus does now. Presently, notice if anyone sins, and none are excluded from that, presently, right at this moment, we have an advocate with the Father. Who is He? Jesus Christ, the righteous. If intercession is about bringing two parties together, and you can just imagine, you've got this group and you've got this group, and I am trying to mediate, to intercede, and I'm trying to bring you both together. That's the idea. Being an advocate or uh, doing the work of advocacy, that's popular. You hear that even talked about sometimes today in social or political settings. It's slightly different. And I think there's a beautiful nuance to the word. The idea of advocacy says I'm not just trying to bring two parties together, but rather that I'm going to get on the side of one party. And I'm going to show favor to that party and try to do all that I can to work it out favorably for them as they deal with the other party. Now the word, and you've probably heard this preached before, so let me just do my due diligence. The word advocate is the word paraclete. And in the original language, you can break that word in half. A prefix para or para means alongside of. Cleat, as you would say, or comes from the verb kaleo, to call. To call to one side is the idea. To call to the side. And the word is used, if you go back in your Bible, John is the only New Testament writer who uses it at all. And he uses it as it falls from the lips of Jesus in John 14, 16, John 14, 26, John 15, 26, and John 16, 7. When he talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. And there, depending on the translation that you're reading, you might find it rendered this way. John 14, 16, I will pray the Father and He will give you another helper. Your version might say, I will pray the Father and He, the Father, will give you another comforter. There's one version who even says counselor. And there are some, I guess for uniformity's sake, who said He will give you another advocate. But notice in these passages, it's not Jesus. Jesus said it's someone other than me. And other than me in this particular context is referencing the work of the Holy Spirit. Now jumping back to 1 John chapter 2 though, John is writing, when I sin, now I, as well as you, we have an advocate with the Father. And we don't have to guess as to who he's speaking of. Jesus Christ, the righteous. The righteous there. Doesn't necessarily speak, I think, so much to his deity, although he is righteous, but about, uh, as it were, his work on our behalf. And you can say those are intertwined and maybe can't be separated one from the other. But Jesus is the one. He is the only one. The Hebrew writer makes this clear as well. As a priest without sin, perfect in every way, he can go before the Father on our behalf. And the Father cannot look at any shortcoming of our advocate, because there are none. 
Instead, He can go as our comforter, as our helper, as our counselor, calling to our side. We have an advocate. Now, most of the time, I admit, and maybe this is my failure, that I have in my mind the picture of a defense attorney. I will, for full disclosure, tell you, thankfully, I've never had to employ a defense attorney. Maybe some of you have. I hope it was for a minor infraction, but nevertheless, a defense attorney. And the defense attorney goes with you to court. And he stands by your side, or sits by your side, literally. And he is the one who is responsible for knowing the law, making sure you are tried according to proper procedure, examining evidence, and... I guess most of the time, in many cases, at least the high-profile cases, even though seemingly all of the evidence is stacked up against you, he's going to try in some way to get the jury to give an innocent verdict, even if you're guilty. We read that and we say, well, is that what Jesus is doing? Now, the Greek orator Demosthenes in about 300 years before Jesus uh, even lived, said that the friends of the accused are those who voluntarily step in and personally urge the judge to rule in favor of the accused when he used this term, advocate or paraclete. So there is that idea, but our influence from English common law and American jurisprudence, too many TV shows about this sort of thing, may color our understanding what I suggest to you is when the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father and I can be thankful for Jesus this morning, why can you be thankful for Jesus and what He's doing right now? Is because He has deep solidarity with you. He shares an actual experience. In other words, if this word means what I'm understanding it to mean, not just from this passage, but from the totality of New Testament teaching, Jesus feels in some way what I feel when I'm tempted. Now, he does not feel, he does not know the fear, uh, the feeling of failure when faced with temptation. Because as the Hebrew writer says, we've referenced it already, he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, but still to know that he knows how I feel. The allure of temptation. Maybe... It can be debated. It would have to be explored at a later date. The separation that sin caused. We remember he cries out to the Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a difficult passage. But perhaps even in that, there is some identification that Jesus had in that moment while hanging on the cross of in some way, some way, somehow, metaphysically, I don't understand how he as the Son could be separated from his Father, from God the Holy Spirit. But he uttered those words for some reason, whether as a quotation from Psalm 22 or actual experience, I cannot say. These are areas we need to pray for deeper understanding and do much more study on. But you see, intercession from the last set of verses happens ongoing. Advocacy seems to be something that Jesus does on an as-needed basis. Now maybe the idea that Jesus is always ready and willing to help speaks to His intercession. But the idea that sometimes... We have an advocate with the Father when we sin. You've sinned before and you felt like, what can I do now? How can I make this right? Is there any hope? And the devil is quick to whisper as it were in your ear and to say, you've messed up too bad this time, old buddy. You're beyond God's love now. Oh, there's no hope for you at all. Maybe it's in those moments when we must remember I have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, I can call to my side. And I can appeal through Him to my Heavenly Father. He's the righteous one. He's the one who remedied my separation, my condemnation, and my sin. We know the evil one accuses us before the Father. The Old Testament and the New Testament alike teach us that. You know what we like to do typically? We like to justify ourselves. I'm not going to share any personal illustrations because one of our rules of marriage class is what we talk about in marriage class stays in marriage class. But what I will tell you and you that are not in marriage class know it to be true if you're married especially. When our spouse catches us in something that we shouldn't be doing, big or small or otherwise, when we mess up, what do we like to do? You're right, honey. You're absolutely right. 100%. I have no uh, leg to stand on. I'm dead to rights. You're correct. No man has ever uttered those words. 
Not without a lot of prompting, maybe. What do we typically do? Well, we defend ourselves. We try to justify our mistake. We rationalize our failures. We shift the blame. We excuse our sins. And we have good precedent for doing that. Adam, where are you? I'm not speaking to my youngest son. I'm speaking as God in Genesis 3 verse 9. It's the question that echoes down through the ages. Adam, where are you? Well, well um, uh, Lord, I'm, I, I, God, I'm over here in the bushes. I'm hiding. Why are you doing that? God's not asking out of ignorance. He's trying to get Adam to take responsibility for his disobedience. Whether he steps out into the open or says it, says it from the cover of the bushes, I don't know. But you remember what he said. That woman whom you gave to me, it's her fault. The woman says, not my fault, the serpent's fault. As we say, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. But they all tried to blame, to excuse, to justify. They had no one to make advocacy on their part. They were all guilty. What will we do when we choose to sin and are beyond a doubt guilty? Who will stand by our side to help? Why should you be thankful for Jesus because of what He does right now on your behalf? If you're a child of God, you leave your case in the hands of the righteous one. And we have that advocate right now that we can go to the Father when we sin. And how this happens as it relates to the dynamics, I don't know. Again, because we are so influenced by television and other media, we see a courtroom, we see God in a big black robe and maybe one of those old, you know, English white braided wigs of sorts. All of that silliness aside, I don't know how He does it. If God sits on His throne and Jesus is at His right hand, uh, has a chair there equal to His, does He whisper in His ear? I don't know how He does it. I can't pretend to tell you any of the mechanics of it, but the tremendous thing about Jesus, here's what I leave you with this morning. The tremendous thing about Jesus is that He has never lost His interest in or His love for His people. Never. We are not to think of Him as having gone through His life upon the earth and His death upon the cross and then being finished with us. To take a perpetual vacation. It's not what the Bible teaches whatsoever. He still bears His concern for us upon His heart. That's who He is at His very basic level. He's still interested in us. He's still interested in me. He's still the sinner's friend. And my hope and your hope as a Christian is His personal involvement right now at the Father's right hand on my behalf and on your behalf. That's the only hope you have. Be thankful for what Jesus does right now for you. Now, the point of saying all of that is simply this, of course. Is Jesus your advocate? Is He one that you can call on to make intercession for you? Only if you have identified yourself with Him through obedience to His Word. We call it the gospel. It means good news, and that's exactly what it is. You've heard already that He is the one who died on the cross for our place, in our place. He is the one who shed His blood, paying the penalty that my sins deserved. He is the one that was placed in the tomb, but death could not hold Him, and three days later, lived again, resurrected. And as the uh, very writer of Revelation will record Jesus as saying, I am He who died, but now I'm alive and alive forevermore. I have an advocate now. I have one that intercedes now that can save me to the uttermost. There's no time. There's no magnitude of my sin. Uh, there's no uh, way possible for my Savior to do other than what He does for me on my behalf, if I am one of His. So I ask you with all seriousness, are you one of His? Is He your Savior? Have you taken what He's done on your behalf? Believed it? Turned away from sin and confessed His name? and then die to sin, and with Him in baptism, and been raised to walk in newness of life. Raised now to have a relationship with Him as your advocate and as your interceder. If you have, then be so thankful. If you have this morning, and perhaps you've not even called upon Him to occupy those roles, you have these resources at your disposal, as it were, and you turn your back, 
You've decided as a Christian, I can live life better my way instead of God's way. Please do not be so foolish. Please again turn to your advocate, your interceder. And the Father will forgive just as these verses promise. And as we've said, if you do not yet have this relationship with your Savior so that you can know Him as your advocate and the one who intercedes on your behalf, then take the steps necessary. Obey the gospel this morning. Let us help you with that if further study is needed. And let us rejoice and let us be thankful for what our Savior does for us. And if we can help you in showing that thankfulness this morning, come as we stand, as we sing together.